I did not set it up, but that last question leads into our next speaker uh, dealing with transmission infrastructure. Bob Martin is the managing director of Christie 55 Solutions. Bob served as New Jersey's Commissioner of Environmental Protection under uh, Governor Christie from 2010 and 2018, and very significantly, he was my boss during that period of time. Prior to public service, Bob was a partner at Accenture LLP with over 25 years experience consulting to a broad variety of businesses and industries. Bob has extensive international experience, including living and working in the UK for five years and doing significant consulting work throughout Europe and Canada. He has demonstrated expertise in all key aspects of the utility industry, including electric generation, electric and gas transmission, electric gas and water distribution operations. Bob has a BA in economics and sociology from Boston College and an MBA concentrating in finance and investments from George Washington University. Bob. Good morning. Nice to see everybody. Uh, thank you, Ray, for inviting me. I don't think he invited me. I think he told me I was showing up today. So anyway, a lot of familiar faces. So uh, great seeing all of you. And I want to thank uh, NJBIA for their leadership in the state for what they do overall uh, and uh, Ray uh, yes Ray worked for me for almost eight years wonderful and Michelle Sakurka thank you for your leadership with NJBIA um, also quickly the, the speakers just before me did a great job and I think they set the stage for a lot of the things I want to talk about right now I also want to just recognize both commissioners that were up here um, they sit in tough jobs having sat in that job and sitting on the policy making side of the world like they have, it's a tough job. And, and so uh, I give them a lot of credit. I respect both those gentlemen a lot and I have conversations today with both of them. And I just want us to all recognize those are tough jobs to do and uh, they do them extremely well. Um, usually I'm talking about public policy side and I'm on the other side, I'm helping to draw up that public policy Today, I'm just gonna provide some input on public policy and focus on transmission overall, because I think it's, it is an important part. And I think the, the beginning part to what I wanna talk about on this comes from the fact that, you know, uh, on the national scale, in Congress, discussion on infrastructure is out there right now. And that's extremely important for the country, for infrastructure itself and investments. Interesting. A big piece of that bill, $73 billion of that bill, is for the electric infrastructure of this country, the transmission infrastructure, the grid. And, and to me, that's what I think is extremely important in elevating what do we talk about infrastructures, not just roads and bridges, but what is it that we need to make sure we have reliability, resiliency long term, and the ability to support the renewable energy that we continue to talk about today. So I'm going to focus on that uh, as a key component to what I'm going to go with here today. Let me see what we got here. There we go. Uh, just for 30 seconds on context, uh, just to make sure we're kind of all talking about the same things here uh, on this. Uh, in the U.S., there's over 600,000 miles of transmission lines in the U.S. They're large and they're complex. That's why I put that number up there. It's not all the same KV out there uh, for, for voltage that's on those lines, so it is significant. And the grid is made up of three major components, Western Interconnection, Eastern, and Texas. We're also tied into Canada and Alaska at the same time, so there's Qu Quebec Interconnection that ties in in Alaska as well. FERC, as you all know, handles that connections or handles the regulation both siting and, and costs that go into transmission of electricity around the country, major role and significant uh, player in all what we do. Overlaying that are the RTOs and I ISOs. Elliot just covered some of that with California and Texas. Each of those kind of operate fairly uh, autonomously on their own, but they're critical to, again, what's going on on the infrastructure side. Um, you know, alternative, you know, alternating uh, current versus direct, not going to get into the, the engineering side of it. I think it is important to recognize as we start talking about, you know, HV, DC, uh, as you start looking at renewable energy, these start to become factors. This is that debate of, you know, AC versus DC was decided long ago. 
uh, with Tesla, uh, Westinghouse versus Edison. Uh, ultimately, Westinghouse won. Edison piled on and took that direction. But now, as you look today with technologies, direct current is playing a is much more significant role as we look at long-term high, you know, high voltage uh, use of direct current for offshore wind and other technologies in the US. Quick context on history. You gotta go back to Pearl Street uh, in lower Manhattan. Thomas Edison laying out for the first 84 customers electric lights in connection uh, with the generating station. You look at the 1930s with the public electric corporations owned pretty much all of it at that time. Holding companies, eight of them, owned like 80% of what was electric companies at that point in time. 1935 Public Utility Holding Company Act was put in place to start from a federal level to start looking at this. Before that, it was only controlled by the states. Now it's starting to put in and start to look at how this is all hung together from electric grid point of view. Um, again, but in 1960s, we start seeing that we all seen transmission and the grid start to flourish. We over 60,000 square miles or 60,000 miles, linear miles of lines that are now in place in the US. Energy Policy Act starts to look at what is the connection between the pricing and allowing generators to tie into the economics of that pricing. Since then, uh, FERC has pretty much controlled most of that and the direction that we go on in this country around it. Not a lot of acts have been put in place since then. Uh, most of it's controlled pretty much by FERC and what they do from a regulatory point of view. So why modernize the grid? That's the backdrop to it, and this is where I wanna focus right now. There are four main reasons why we need to modernize the grid in this country. First and foremost is reliability. Again, we've got aging infrastructure out there and I'm gonna cover that in a few minutes. Resiliency, again, climate change, severe weather, cybersecurity threats, all play a critical, are playing critical factors in decisions in the future for protecting the grid and how we move forward with it. Efficiency. We want to drive down the cost of electricity. Part of that is how do we control and manage the grid overall to continue to push down that cost and also to leverage new technologies. Question came a few minutes ago about microgrids and how do they fit in distributed generation. I see those hand going in hand in hand and tied together with the overall grid. So they're not separate. I think they're part of it and overlay and are tied together in the long term. And the last major factor, and I'm gonna talk a bit probably more about this than anything else, renewable energy is gonna be a major factor in driving what investments are needed in the, trans, in the overall grid itself in the United States going forward. Major factor, but major investment. As I said, I'm not here to set policy, I'm here to kind of lay out the facts of what do we need to invest in. If we're gonna continue down, and we are gonna continue down a renewable path, in this country, what does that mean and where do we need to make that investment so we have the reliability and we're able to have the resiliency necessary to make that happen? Simple picture? No, it's not. This is not, this is all strung together with multiple different levels of voltages. It's large, it's complex, and again, this is why it's not a simple answer when you start talking about, hey, let's go upgrade and modernize the grid. It's not one single formula. You've got a lot of keep, continue a lot of components to it that need to be tied together. And we need to make sure that long term, we're kind of overlaying that when we look at it. Let's start with reliability. Aging infrastructure, again, a lot of the architecture comes back from the 1950s and 1960s. That's still a lot of the key architecture that's still in place today. Hence, the age of the infrastructure is old and it's gonna to have to be upgraded no matter what we think. 70% of the, of the lines and transformers are over 25 years old and the average age of the infrastructure is 40 years old. Again, Power outages, power outages in the U.S. account for about $170 billion a year. 
And again, that's all aspects of it. So I'm not just pointing to transmission, but you have to look at aspects of generation, transmission, and distribution. That's a very big piece uh, of our economy that gets wasted every single year, and hence reliability overall is critical. Resiliency, severe weather, uh, having a front row seat to Superstorm Sandy uh, showed us and showed me and showed all of us the vulnerability we have in so many ways in this country. And again, the multiple storms that have followed since Sandy. Again, having a front row seat, I was able to see what things we needed to do, but not just in, not just in water infrastructure and bridges and road infrastructure, it also showed us the electric infrastructure that needed to be upgraded and fixed long term. And it's critical that we look at it from a weather, from a climate change point of view, to make sure we can focus on it. Elliot uh, was a great tee up to this story as well. California wildfires. Some of the old transmission lines were igniting a lot of those fires out in California. That's one of the many reasons. I mean, the, the power outages Elliot talked about very specifically some of the congestion challenges they had with power in California. But a lot of the wild, several of the wildfires have contributed because, or started because of transmission challenges and some of the old infrastructure that's in place out there. Again, those transmission lines need to be replaced, they need to be fixed, and there needs to be resiliency long-term to make them work. Extreme weather. Again, I talked about Superstorm Sandy. You look at just recently, kind of the deep freeze in Texas. A lot of factors contributed to it. It wasn't a simple one item. It was multiple factors, including really bad planning from ERCOT at the time around all of this. Their lack of interconnection to the rest of the grid was not there. So they had no ability or very little, limited ability to go back to the grid to get electricity when electricity being generated in Texas ran into problems because of the cold. Again, these are the kind of planning things that we need to talk about. Elliot hit it just right on, on it. I thought just targeted very clearly. We've got a plan for this. This is not stuff that just happens tomorrow. These take decades of, decades of investments that are required to make that happen. Last area on resiliency is cybersecurity. The threats continue significantly. And I know that a lot of the states are looking at this. I know a lot of the federal government's looking at it. Recently, DOE has put a major study together to address this. You know, we look at some of the pipeline issues that have had challenges around this. And this is, again, one of the major things from a resiliency point of view that technology can help and will be needed to put more into this area in the future to make this work. Efficiency. Again, driving down cost is important. You know, one of the key things of a grid optimizing, optimizing the grid such that the fact that it's able to help and lower the cost overall to consumers, to me is an important factor of what it has to handle. Congestions in several areas of several grids make that, make spike up those costs in a lot of different places. And you see that constantly. And that's what PJM and that's what the ISOs do is to try to minimize that cost and try to balance that out as best they can. But again, they can only do that based on a grid that is sophisticated, has new technologies, and continue to be modernized overall. Efficiency also, as I mentioned earlier, allows us to add new technologies. You know, so to invest in the overall grid itself needs us the ability, gives us the ability then to add on the microgrids to be able to plug those in, in many ways. And because again, I see my, I see microgrids as an add on to the grid overall. You're able to island when you need to. It provides resiliency. It allows us to be able to provide electricity to critical infrastructure as necessary after a storm or other events. It also helps to drive down electricity. 
If we're able to allow that in the industri you know, industrial and commercial sectors to be able to move off a grid, you know, and at the right times, it allows us to drive down the costs. Again, ability to effectively use the grid itself. It allows us, and, and Elliot also talked about this, kind of how do we utilize storage technology? To me, that's extremely important. You know, to be able to call it up and pull it up as a generating resource when you need it is going to be important. Our grid doesn't support that today in most cases. And so we have to invest to be able to manage that to make sure that we can, we can do that in the future. The last category is kind of the, the you know, advanced grid hardware. And I just put this in the category of overall efficiency, ability to manage loads, be able to move around electricity as necessary, ability to manage it the best we can. So again, a lot of different aspects of it, including energy efficiency components to it that we don't have today. And again, that's, those are significant dollars and it's gonna take time to put those in. So the last big area is renewable, where we've talked about a lot today. I mean, the stats are there, right? This is from Department of Energy. These are their projections. Today, we're sitting at around 21% renewable energy as our, gen as our source. It's by, by 2020, I'm mean, sorry, by 2050, we're expecting that to be 42%, which is significant. We still got other resources, especially natural gas that are still gonna be in place. There'll still be some nuclear that's projected to still be in place. Again, those are critical resources, baseload resources that are gonna to need to be there, both the natural gas and the nuclear for the future. But given the projections that are coming down the road, we need to be able to accommodate the grid long-term and the investments around those renewable energies. The second side of this, the right side of the, of the chart, shows you where that's coming from. Department of Energy is projecting that about 81% of that, of renewable energy that's out there by 2050, 81% uh, of that will be solar and will be um, offshore wind and onshore wind. A gigantic chunk of our energy source is coming from there. That's their projections. Let's talk about the, the grid in a lot of different ways right now. There's the offshore component to it. Let's stay with the offshore piece a bit for one second here. I think it's very apropos for New Jersey. You look at what has to be done offshore. That's critical and that's big and it's expensive. It's not gonna be cheap to build that portion of it for the transmission component for the offshore wind. You know, we're committed to making sure to getting that offshore wind in place but to be able to tie it into our grid requires two components. First is the offshore component to it. Then there's the significant onshore component to it. Those investments need to be made. And they're going to be, need to be made by you know, a lot of electric companies, the PSE and Gs of the world, JCP and Ls of the world, on a, on, a, on a state like New Jersey. They're going to have to focus on that to make sure that happens and it gets plugged into the grid properly. It also needs to make sure that PJM understands what upgrades and what planning needs to occur over this period of time to make that work long-term. So it's not just the onshore piece. Developers will work on that. Obviously there's bids out now from PJM and the BPU to try to figure out how this all fits together for the offshore piece. To me, the more significant piece we've got a plan for is the onshore piece, both here in New Jersey and in other states. Same challenges in New England. They got to plug that into their grid and it just doesn't plug it in, it doesn't plug in easily. And a lot of these plants aren't designed to be on the, uh, interconnections aren't designed to build on the coast and head in. Usually if they're from the mainland out to the coastlines. So the challenge is here, you can see, New England's going to have that same challenge and have to build out their infrastructure there to make that work. In New York, the same thing. They're gonna be plugging in to two places. They're gonna to have to try to figure out how to tie this in through Long Island and make the interconnections there, through LIPA, 
um, and PSEG uh, Long Island to run that and make that get that plugged in. But they also got to figure out how to bring it in to New York City. New York City already has serious uh, congestion problems today to try to figure out how to bring this electricity all the way in into the city. You're not going to be able to bring it all the way just from Long Island. You're going to have to plug it in coming up uh, into the city through the harbor and make that happen. That is not easy. There's not a lot, of, a lot of room to do it. As you can see on the second one from New York, I, I, I liked these pictures because this starts to show the significant portion of the online, uh, the on land portion that need to be put in place. They're extreme, they're, it's significant amount of work and it's investment It's gonna have to take time to make that work. The last piece to investing on the grid, and there's a lot of different models that are out there. You know, DOE has put out some, separate companies have put out some, but they're, they're talking about how do we put together kind of a, you know, a HVDC infrastructure nationally. Now, I'm not, I'm not advocating for it or against it. My point is, is these are the kinds of things that are on the table for discussion for public policy. This would be overlaid. What you're seeing here is a larger HVDC infrastructures, or at least one model or one, one suggestion that would overlay the current grid we have today. Again, significant investments. I mean, portion of these are already being well discussed and moving forward. I mean, there's one project out in, that comes from uh, Iowa out through Illinois, and it's, it's gonna be an underground HVDC line running along underneath rail tracks or next to rail tracks in the same easement areas, moving wind from the Midwest to further in towards the PJM grid. Those are the kind of projects that we're gonna to start to see happen a lot more. And then you start to say, how do you overlay that together and make it work? I'm not sure, I'm not, I don't have the answer to how this fits together. Um, but again, if you lay this over top, the current grid, it's going to be significant, and the cost will be significant as well. So what does that mean for the transmission investment? Ray, is that a subtle hint? No, okay. <laughs> Ray's used to this after eight years with me. Um, you know, the, the investment, so what this gets us to the investment portion of this, which I think is, is really important part. I mean, over the years, you can see the investments have been significant about 20 billion a year. They're accelerating to the high 20s every year going forward. That's gonna be necessary to make it happen. If you look at the studies that are being done right now, you know, the, the amount of money they're talking about between now and 2030 in the grid, this is a Princeton University study, to be able to work towards the zero carbon future of 2050, we're looking at investments of, two, of 360 billion dollars through 2030. If you start looking out to 2050, you're talking about $2.4 trillion. So when we talk about renewable energy, and it's going to be part of the future, we also need to make sure that we're talking about the overall cost of what this takes to get it done. And this is part of the cost of getting it done long term. And I think we need to figure that out as we go move forward on it. Again, uh, I talked about several components to this, but you know, where's the money coming from? You know, utilities are investing uh, a significant money over the years. Um, we expect that you know, 73 billion, as I mentioned, for the infrastructure bill is a good jump start into a lot of this. You know, private equity is getting involved in some of these projects, these private projects that are going and building out the grids, including some of the offshore wind stuff. That's where they're playing in on this stuff. So there's private money being pushed in as well into the grids. Long-term, both FERC and the RTOs and ISOs need to play a key role in figuring out the planning for all of this, but also where's the money coming from? You know, I, and how do we pay for it long-term? You know, and obviously there, there has to tie back into rates somewhere, but again, it gets back to that cost I talked about earlier. You know, you want to balance out efficiency and improve the cost at the same time, you don't want to take that cost, to, you don't increase the cost of this. So in summary, 
I think it's extremely important now that we're having a national debate around infrastructure, because I think it is, I think an important part of that infrastructure is the transmission electric grid infrastructure of this country, given where we're moving on the electrification across the country long term, and how do we invest in that? Reliability, resiliency, uh, and efficiency will be key drivers in the future. Those will be key drivers no matter what we do, whether we do renewable energy or not. Those are factors we have to deal with, and we're going to have to make investments because of that no matter what. Significant you know, investments of the grid, again, the, major, the one and major priority will be renewables. That's going to be the biggest driver, I think, of these investments going forward. Um, you know, whether, whether, as I mentioned, those three other areas are important, that's going to be the biggest driver going forward. And again, uh, my point on FERC and the RTOs and ISOs playing key roles have to play into this long term. The federal infrastructure dollars, uh, as I've already mentioned, will play a key role in jump-starting it, but that's still not. If I look at those numbers, $360 billion before, by 2030, just that's only, that's only a small fraction of that money, but it still needs to be more investment. With that, um, I thank you. Uh, my, you know, again, my take on all this is, you know, from a, from a, a country that's moving towards renewable energy, uh, no matter what we have to do, the transmission grid is a vital to this country long term. And uh, I'm, this is not a sales pitch for anything. It's just looking at the age of that infrastructure and resiliency. It's extremely important that we invest and need to invest long term as if it were any other part of our infrastructure in this country. Thank you very much. So thank you, Bob. Am I on? Yes. Um, you laid out a very convincing case um, for a need to address uh, the transmission system and, um, and explain the complexity of it all. When we work for you, whenever we had a problem to be solved, you would always ask, who owns it? So who owns this? Good question, Raymond. Um, <laughs> I'd say something else, but I'm on a mic and it's being recorded. Um, no, I mean, the reality is, I mean, from a, a public policy point of view, I mean, certainly, I mean, we have to look at it. We have to look at the federal level first and foremost on this. I think Congress in ad allocating money to it. I think FERC has to play the critical role overseeing this planning. But to me, the, the, if you want to pinpoint where, I mean, to me, the RTOs play the critical factor. The PJMs of the world have got to be, and the ISOs have to be the key or, organizer in the middle of all this because they see all the parts of it. Very few see it all. I mean, you know, PSE&G sees their piece of the world. JC and p &L sees their piece of the world. Guess what? The, the RTOs see a large, see the largest portion of this and see where resources are and where they're not and where the efficiencies have to be put long term to build it out. So, I mean, there's a co clear collaboration. Um, you know, Elliot put up a whole bunch of, uh, I'm sorry, the other gentleman put up, um, uh, put up another map of collaboration. There is collaboration that's going to be necessary, but that's where I'd start the point very quickly, where it's got to come, come from. Any questions from the audience? Name and where you're from, please. Steve Gadell, National Financial Strategic Solutions. Final question for me. These are really large numbers, right? It's all on the call side. Uh, in business, the one thing that we always look at is what is the total revenue? And then as a percent, what would these costs be? And then we get into the fact of how much of that is going to be expected to be renewed every year as an expense to just keeping the business going. And then you're going to make a projection on uh, the renewables. And that's an evolving thing, right? So the costs are going to change. You only know what the costs are today yeah. and what you expect to save. Uh, and you can make a projection on it. That's going to be a large thing over 30 years as the costs come down. 
but I came to get a handle, a sense for what these large numbers are. Uh, I'd like to know what that total revenue is over the U.S. that these services are generating. So if we talk about $2.4 uh, trillion, is that $300 million or $300 trillion in total revenue, and you're looking at less than 2% of that cost, and then you look at it and say, from an investment point of view, it's not a bad thing. Right? Yeah. Your yeah. I mean, uh, your points, your points right, uh, your points right on. Yeah, you got to look at where's the, where's the. It's a cost benefit analysis of whatever you invest long term. Now, I hear you, um, loud and clear on it. I mean, part of it is, you know, part of it is just basic infrastructure, right? I, I, I you have to recognize that part of it that for resiliency and reliability. You've got to have it in place. You, know, you, you can't. This can't fall apart long term, and so there is a, a minimum level of investment that has to occur on it. I mean, the renewable piece. Yeah, I think it does does require that challenge. Okay, if we're going to invest this, if we're going to make this investment, what returns do we get out of it long term, and does this drive down costs long term? Uh, fair, fair equation. I don't have that answer, uh, but you know, there's enough analysis out there. But the the answer is. You're right on, but I think you have to treat it in two different buckets. One is just true raw infrastructure that has to be maintained and, and modernized no matter what we do. And some of it is, okay, I'm gonna make investments, what kind of returns do I get on those? Fair questions. Any more questions? Bob, uh, one more. Yeah. This will be the last question before I conclude and we go to lunch. of uh, maintaining and upgrading the grid. Um, so you cited the importance of the federal government and the uh, regional transmission operators. What about the state? Uh, what role does the state of New Jersey and um, its agencies uh, play in this? Um, good, that's a great question. I mean, I think, I think the states continue to have to play a, a significant role in it. I didn't mean to stop at the RTOs. I try to not go, drag it all the way down, but no, but I think the decisions, what we need in New Jersey to meet our needs across the board, whether it's the, the commercial needs, industrial needs, the ratepayer needs, you know, across the board, I think they've got to feed that into this and part of the overall planning effort. Um, you know, and I have a lot of respect for the BPU over the years. They've done a lot of good work feeding into PJM. And so I, I you know, I think that is going to continue and should continue long term. But uh, the BPU certainly needs to play an active role in it, um, and, and they do. They, at least what I've seen in the past, they have fed into PJM, whether PJM's always accepted it or not, or whatever. I, I, you know, I have my opinions on PJM over the years, too, but uh, that have been formed by uh, direct, uh, direct workings with PJM. But my, my overall take on it is, you know, from a public policy point of view, you know, certainly, you know, the, the governor's office, BPU, DEP, uh, we, even at DEP, we always looked at what was going on and what was going to happen long term with the energy needs that have to be fed into that overall. Okay. Bob, um, thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. So this concludes our morning portion of this conference. We have some excellent speakers in the afternoon, uh, many of them from, from the utilities and the energy sectors that are going to be directly impacted and who will be, pl be playing part of our energy future. Hopefully, as many of you will stick around as you can. I know it's a long day. I know a number of people are coming in later on as well for the afternoon session. Uh, we are going to break now for lunch. We will reconvene approximately 1245, 1250. So uh, enjoy your uh, lunch and uh, enjoy your networking. Thank you.